little things she got in the church. Where are we in Ohio? Ohio. I'm not guessing that. Out of 50 states. <laughs> and, uh, but it's like a, if, if you feel this way, it's scripture kind of thing. And, and she's kept me for a long time. So she's going to make me a copy if anybody would like. I'm going to post it. If anybody wants a copy, I can give it to you. Okay? All right, here we go. The dot, the dot, the top, 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 the is a conglomeration of, of discussions I've had all week, okay? And some of them got me kind of stirred up, and some of them get stirred up, it makes me study more. So, hallelujah. Right. Yeah. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, God is making the world. In seven literal days, he made the world. And on the seventh day, he rested. Now, see, for, for, we need to take note of this. This is not even a message. We need to take note of certain things. Like God doesn't ever get tired, so why would he need to rest? Right. Why did he take seven literal days to do this thing when he could have just snapped his fingers and it had been here, right? That means he's setting us up for something. He's showing us something. He said, for instance, in Second Peter, he said, As a, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Okay? So we're coming up on, just in case you didn't know, the 7,000th year of earth existence. Rest. Okay, so all right. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. And I'm going I'm I'm to pass over a bunch of stuff. First of all, when Adam was made, he was as much female as he was male. Now, I ain't got an anatomical chart on me to figure that one out. I'm just going to tell you, I just know that he went to sleep, and what a nap. Because when he woke up, the female side of him was gone, and somebody had to figure that thing out. That's another story. Suddenly, when he woke up, he did not talk about his feelings. <laughs> he did not want to shop at all, ever. And he can watch football all day and never go to the bathroom. It's that bad. But here's the part I want you to get. I talked about this a little bit before, but it's like, we're getting into the end of this thing. It's like, nobody makes any sense. We're, we're getting dumber as we go. You know, Romans 12, 2 does not see does not say and be conformed to his image by the removal of your mind. <laughs> Whose image are we made in? His. Who are we like? Him. Our brain is just like Jesus' brain. Yeah. Now his ways are higher and his thoughts, his access, his, his, his resources, and the way he thinks and does things are, are way larger in scale than we are. But it's still, we're still connected. Well, it's, it should be, Ken. But like we'll, tell, we'll go around and say that, that God took a, a two-year-old and gave him leukemia. Well, we would throw somebody under the jail if they did that as a human being. Yeah. We, we're trying to transpose logic that on God that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. And so I'm just telling you right there, we're made in his image. And then just as a side shot, he blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the earth, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And he gave that to man. And as far as I can tell, he never took it back. Right. He blessed him and he never unblessed him. Even when he failed, he still had access to a blessing. Okay. What does that mean? That means he has access to the favor of God. Yeah. You know, that may not be good to you, but next page. That's In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, then he did this strange thing. He said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. He gave Adam had everything on the earth. Everything. Except one thing. Yeah. <laughs> what? Next page. <laughs> what are you thinking, God? Yeah. Why do you do that? This is everything. Next thing. I'll tell you why. This single verse completely defeats the ideas put forth in Reformed theology and Calvinism. From the beginning, God gave man a choice. And if Adam, if all men were in Adam, then all men get a choice. You can't get past that. No. 
That's right. You can't get past Genesis with that garbage that people are trying to put forth now that God's already pre-selected who he wants in heaven. He is not pre-selected. What well, did he say? He has pre-selected everyone he wants in heaven. He wants everyone in heaven. Yes. You have been pre-selected. Amen. Next page. Tell it, Pastor. In fact, this. Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but in law is long suffering toward us, not willing that any, 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 any should perish, but that all, all, all should come to repentance. What is the will of God stated in the word of God? That he wants everybody in heaven. He don't want anybody not to go. In fact, he goes on to say, next page. He said in Matthew 25, he says, And he'll also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. Prepare for who? The devil and his angels. Hell wasn't even made for man. That's right. He doesn't want anybody to go. He doesn't make things to throw away. That's right. Now, why is this important? Because this thing, this weight is coming over. And I'm just going to break from my notes a minute and tell you what I think it is. I think it's the spirit of the Antichrist. Come on. That's what it is. What is the spirit of the Antichrist? It, it, it does not declare that Jesus is coming in the flesh. Right. Right. Why did Jesus come in the flesh? If he didn't come in the flesh, none of us could get to him. He had to become us so we could become him. If he came in this flesh, he had to come in all flesh. Right. He was the last Adam. He was the one that undid what the first one messed up. If the first one was declared that all men were in him, then guess what? The second Adam, the last Adam, all men are in him too. All they ever stepped through the door. Yeah, that's it. Man, come on, man. Because the reason I'm saying this is people are being, I know good people that love the Lord are being tripped up by people walking around. And I don't know what's wrong with you. To be honest with you, I think you need a cat skin. Next page. <laughs> The people that are going around trying to say God doesn't want somebody in heaven. What 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 team are you on? Right. Who are you working for? My Bible says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have what everlasting life." I know that's the most overused verse in the Bible. Nobody looks up and hear it quoted. But I want you to look at it one more time. God loved who? The world. He's not even talking about the church. He's talking about, for God so loved the ones that shouted and crucified. For God so loved Adolf Hitler. For God so loved the son of Bin Laden. Yes, sir. He gave his son, his only son, that whoever would just believe, receive him into this. Yes. Would perish for that everlasting life. Next page. Your first thumbprint of God is God's not trying to keep anybody out of heaven. That's how you know it's him. He's not, he's not trying to exclude anybody. Right. You know what? Here's the thing. We, we had, for 300 years, the church didn't even have a Bible to argue over. Right. And to build doctrines that exclude each other. Right. And camp out around certain favorite sins that condemn certain people. Oh. They just had a testimony that they love God and what he's done for their life. And I want you to understand that our message needs to be so simple right. that even somebody who has no idea who Abraham was can receive Jesus as Lord of their life. Right. If we complicate it any more than that, who are we working for? Right. Next page. Yeah. Deuteronomy 8, this is his, this is his words, not mine. Deuteronomy 8, 12 and 30, he said, he's telling the children of Israel, I'm going to send you to the promised land. And you're going to go in there, and I just don't want you to forget about it. Because okay. when you go in there, when you have eaten and are full, not if, uh -huh. not if, when, when you've eaten and you're full, and when you have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, God's got this hang up about multiplication. Yeah. Yeah. And he's not enough to him. He wants you to multiply. Yeah. Yeah. You know, two plus three is five, two times three is six. I like multiplication better. Yeah. Is that too fast for you? I have flashcards on the website. <laughs> I mean, don't pull your phone out on them. If I say multiply, multiply. He's got a plan for you. It doesn't involve you just eking out a 40 day week. That's right. 40 hour week. It doesn't have you eking out a living and trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. He's got a plan for you, just like Pastor Jude was saying. Maybe we haven't tapped into his excess. Maybe we haven't tapped into his abundance. So we can lavish and go, you no, know, so we can just get out of this hole we're in. It's yeah. like, you know, like refrigerators are terrible. These are things that are distractions. 
Things that I want to be able to get past them. How about you? Right? right? Okay. Yeah. Next page. Reach every comma. Psalm 35, 27. <laughs> so let them shout for joy and be glad, who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. He has pleasure <laughs> in the prosperity of his servants. Now see, here's the problem. When you share the, a lot of people in the kingdom now, when they hear the word prosperity, they can't, they acquaint with something uh, uh, evil. Because you've seen people take this and run it out to, to embrace greed right. and avarice. I'm trying to say that God is on your side. Right. If you think, Tim, and I've heard this week already, that maybe God put suffering in our way so we'll learn to love him more. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. No. If he would do that, why would he put it on Jesus so he could die for ours right. and in our place? Yeah. Right. I'm trying to tell you God's on your side. He, his, what pleasures him, what makes him the happiest is when you get it. And let me break, can I take this back to the human level? Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm not sitting there going, strike out, Logan, strike out, Logan. Right. Maybe you'll learn humility. Right. 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 I mean, you, you'd think I need some sort of seizure medication. <laughs> no, I'm pulling for my son. Yeah. Hit, hit, the, hit the tumble. Do well on this tour. I'm pulling for my children because I want my kids to succeed. Yeah. I want good things to happen to my children. Well, why on earth would we think if we're that good and God's this good that he'd be any different with his kids? Yeah. That's good, Pastor. I just, I'm just saying, if I didn't have a Bible, I should know that, right? Yeah. yeah. I should know that. Next page. Third John 2, he said, Beloved, I pray, I wish that you may prosper in all things and be in heaven, yep. just as your soul prospers. Yes, you know what, let me ask you this. How many of you would wish any kind of physical ailment of any kind on your child? No. From a cramp to cancer, I wouldn't have it. Oh, and I can tell you, once you see it and you see it acting, I, 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 I'm bringing a body. Even you know it's not something that's supposed to be there. Yeah. It brings a body to a confused state of being. Therefore, if God's not the author of confusion, how on earth can I possibly give him credit? Right. Or blame him for the thing. You know what? And, and, and I'm gonna get to it. Just hang with me, okay? But I want you to just put your hand on each other and say, Lord, I know, Lord, I know. that you want me to prosper want me in to all prosper. things oh. and be in hell. Just as just my, soul my soul prospers. My soul needs to prosper for this to take place. If I'm completely consumed with thoughts and negative emotions and I can't get my mind on him for all the junk in my life, how are we expecting not to be sick and depressed all the time? i got to get all that to shut up and take some time and listen to him and spend some time till the joy of the Lord fills my soul. Right? That's right. Deuteronomy 30. You know this one by heart. He said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he tells us the answer to the quiz. <laughs> right, yeah. This is cheating, isn't it, Kim? He said, Yes, yeah, it's not a big thing to figure out here. Right. Gee, what should I have? <laughs> blessing or cursing? I don't know, you know. <laughs> Choose life. <laughs> they all go with life there. <laughs> This is why I always order the same thing on the menu every time I go to a restaurant, the same restaurant, because I'm not taking a chance. I know that works. I'll get that right there. Sorry, if you don't like that, we'll go to another restaurant. I'll show you what I ordered there. Why am I choosing life so that both me and my descendants my wife did a wonderful study last Sunday night at our house with you about the fact that the choice between Jacob and Esau. And how, if you'll look at how, how simple it looked that Esau wanted that bowl of porridge, wanted that bowl of stew more than he wanted his birthright. Because in that moment when he's so, uh, uh, his flesh is clamoring and clawing at him to, to need that bowl of stew, in that moment his eternity doesn't matter. Right. And that's how it is with things in the flesh. Right. But what's bad about that is that he gave him the stew and he gave him his birthright. And from there on where it read, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It should have said Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But he lost his, he lost his history. He lost his place in history because his flesh made the choice and not him. Next page. 
John 10.10, 10, you know this in my heart, so the thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. May I say to you again that I've discovered in my lifetime that the thief is not the devil per se, it's religion. It's the stuff we've done with the truth, the stuff we've done with his freedom, the laws we've written on top of the laws we should be over with that have put people in place where it comes to steal and kill and destroy. We're so worried about a woman cutting her hair or wearing gold for crying out loud. Can you not see the forest for the trees that you're hitting with your head because you've got the word in front of your eyes? I'm saying that we need to think a little further along about what he was talking about and realize he's not so hung up on the things that we have let ourselves get hung up on. Yeah. Like, for instance, you know, people that are like that, they don't want to talk about the fact that they're wearing a piece of clothing that's made of two different materials. That's right. That's right. That's You're going to get all long. I mean, let's just go long, okay? Yeah. yeah. I'm saying that the thing that we should be, I asked somebody the other day, and I'll say it again, if you could condense the Bible, down to one word. In other words, that you're going to take that, that Bible and you're going to give everybody one message about God to identify him. What would be the title of that book? It has to be love. Yes. Can't be judgment. Can't be sin. Because that's what it's about. It's a love letter. It's a love story. The whole thing was a love song written to humanity so that he could gather us back because we had been scattered from him. Yes. Anything that gets in the way that is a waste of time. He said, I have come that you might have life, and that you may have it more abundantly. Is that how you describe your life? I don't know if that's how I've been describing my life. It's more abundant. I think I've been drawing in a breath. We watched a, we watched somebody go meet Jesus the other night. And I saw as that breathing slowed down, it just kept slowing down. I thought, you know what? That breath is what keeps us here. That breath that we're breathing is what keeps us on this side. Are we breathing in the life he's given us? Because, see, you're autonomic in breathing. You're not paying attention. That's right. Right? Yeah. But why don't we take a, just take a few moments and pay attention to the breath that he's given us? Am I breathing in abundant life, or am I just keeping my heart going? You follow what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, God wants you to win in life and avoid trouble. Did you know that? Yeah. Boy, you need to write this down. He wants you to win and avoid trouble. He does not put stuff in front of you. When, when my kids were learning how to walk in, I didn't put roller skates in front of them. What's this, Sherry? Woo! No, we didn't do that. Because we're not morons or sadists. We want to help our kids. We don't put things in their way to make life difficult. We get things out of the way to make life easier for them. Because I'm a good father. Now, I didn't carry Logan around until he was 18 years old. I had to watch him learn how to walk. And some of that involved him falling down. But what would I do? Stand on and say, now, if you don't do better next time, no, I'll help him up. Yeah. Well, see, there are people that believe God's that way, Kelly. Well, that's what he's, he's trying to trip you as you go down the path. And, and he's, you know, he's, he's your biggest enemy. And I'm thinking, no, he's not. Lord, he's not. And I know this is for me. Next page. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe two things. Number one, that he is God. And, in other words, as much as you believe he is God, you have to believe he's a rewarder. Yeah. Yeah. You can't call him God without calling him a rewarder. Oh, yeah. That's his nature. That's his, that's his personality. On the Enneagram, whatever the one that rewards, that's who he is. Right. No matter what that is, either. <laughs> he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Some of you are missing your reward because you're not looking for him. Okay, next page. I'll go somewhere else. Right. Ephesians three twenty says, "Down to him is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, according to the power that's active in us." You know, Ken's got this big pedal board back here, but until he pushes the button and the little light comes on, the pedal board is passive. It's not adding anything to it. In other words, a signal comes in, a signal goes out. But when he pushes his foot down and that little light comes on, the pedal adds something to the signal. That's called being active. And he says here, the power that works in us, works literally means active. That means the power that you receive, the knowledge you receive, the revelation you receive, when I put myself in conjunction with it, now power is available to me. Thanks, Pastor. Good enough. 
Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a rock? Watch this. It's so funny. Puts the tartar sauce on that rock and he breaks his teeth off. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you ask for a fish, watch this one. <laughs> we'll put a cobra in there. <laughs> one night I thought we were going out with a bunch of football players and we're going to go frog gigging. Oh. You ever remember frog gigging? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I had one friend, and uh, he was always, his, his family was kind of well to do it. He always had the latest gadgets. And so I'm out there with my little, you know, ever ready. Last night, and he comes up with this headset beam thing that can put a spot on Mars. And, yeah. and so we're out there, and here's all these tough football players. And you know how you, you frog you, you spot that eye, and that eye looks back at you, and you stick the long stick with the gig, and you bring it back. Only this time, when they stuck in the long stick with the gig on it, they brought back a snake on it. Oh, yeah. And if you want to see people running for the woods as they lights bobbing as they ran across the field, <laughs> If you would have gotten the grass, yeah! <laughs> so if you ask for a frog and I give you a snake, that's the kind of picture you get. I got to tell this story to you. <laughs> so later that same night, this has nothing to do with this. Some guys got there late, and we're camping out at my, my dad's house. And uh, they said, John, what? I don't know why those came to me. <laughs> we found this dead snake on the road, and we want to put it in this guy's sleeping bag. I said, no, no. But then I said, okay, just put it up on the head. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time we got there, everybody in the campgrounds knew about the snake being dead, but the, except the guys were sleeping oh, there. No. So everybody, some of the greatest acting I've ever seen in my life is when all of a sudden we're all waiting for our come. Oh, gee, oh, God! And he's jumping out. So then one guy picks up a log out of the fire and is beating this dead snake and flying. Sparks are going everywhere. Anyway, that, that stayed a secret until we graduated. We were freshmen. Okay. Had nothing to do with it. It's out now. It's out now. Sorry. Uh, next page. Number three, God is a giver who adds to and multiplies your life. He doesn't do those things. I don't care if you think you've got a verse that proves otherwise, you've got to give me all the verses. Because you can't take one little thing and build a doctrine out of it. It's got to be true about the whole thing or it's not true. You've missed it or taken it out of context. For instance, it's like those, you know, those spikes when you go into a parking lot that you can't back up over. That's God. He may always do more. He can always do more. He'll never do less. Next page. Well, okay, so this is the warm, fuzzy puppies and rainbow sermon. Woo! Well, okay. <laughs> this got my attention the other day. I just want to share it with him. We'll go. You know, Paul's on that, that ship, and he's a prisoner. And then the great storm comes, and then he tells them how to get to the island where they're all saved. And so everybody's looking at Paul, who was a prisoner. And now suddenly he's got authority. And they go off on that island, and they're fixing to build a fire. And Paul reaches in to get us some sticks, and a viper, instead of an adder, bites him on the arm. And he's got it hanging on his arm, and he goes to the fire. And all the people that are on the boat go, wow, he's really cursed. Man, we haven't been through the shipwreck. This guy must have really killed somebody that does something. God will hunt him down wherever he goes. But then when he slung the snake off in the fire, they said he's a god. And I'm just thinking, boy, how quickly people's opinions change. I'm the devil, I'm, I'm God. They don't know how the snake thing turns out, right? But when he was hanging on him, he threw it in the fire and said it, but he shook off the creature in the fire and suffered no harm. How they were expecting that he would swell up suddenly and fall down dead. But after they looked for a long time and they saw no harm coming to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. All I'm saying is, it didn't say that the snake bite didn't hurt. Don't you know it did? Yeah. It just said the venom that he brought had no effect on it. Yeah, we're living in a place where there are snakes and they will bite you in a church house. Right. Mm -hmm. 
They'll find a way to bring pain to you. And you know what? I wish I could tell everybody in the room that there's a, that there's a place where there's no pain and no discomfort and, and no nothing in your life that will bring about some sort of tragedy. I can't tell you that. All I can tell you is that the venom that was in that thing that came to kill you can be slung off and not affect you if you'll keep walking to the dark direction you're going. Yes, he told him in John, said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you'll have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. He didn't even say you might have tribulation. He said, in the world, you don't have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Amen. That means when it does bite, when it does hurt, when you don't think you're going to make it, hang on, because he has already overcome whatever was in that snake, and he's going to bring, bring you through it. Yes. Next page. Now I'll show you a little example. In Psalm 91, it says, verse number 7, it says, A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Who is he talking to? He's talking to me. I don't know if he's talking to you. You've got to decide if he's talking to you. Because right. what he's saying is that, that something could happen, that there would be 11,000 dead people standing, laying on the ground around you, and you're the only one that made it because you have a secret place with the Most High God. You have called his name. You have whispered his name in the night. He is your habitation. He is your sacred, the safe place. I don't know what you believe, but I know in whom I have believed. Now let me give you an example of what this next page. This is 11,000 zeros. You see yourself there in the middle? It's hard to tell. It took it a long time. See, there you were. But see, sorry, let me break it down to just a thousand. Just that, that thousand. Wow. You're still in the middle of that. Wow. All those are dead except you. I mean, God's showing favoritism? I don't know. I don't think he's showing favoritism. I think he's rewarding faith. Yes, he what I'm trying to tell you is that in this world, God has limited himself from involvement with us because of our sin. I said this the other day and it stuck in my mind. The devil's under our feet, but he's not under their feet. Right. He's in charge of them. He's their God. He's their Lord. He's their master. They belong to him. Until we bring them back, then that's, that sin will kill them the second God slips through the sky and reaches earth. So he sent us here as ambassadors, filled with his spirit, filled with his word, to go through these snakes. And some of them are going to bite us and some of them are going to hurt us. Some people die. I can't, I can't explain all that. I just know who God is because I know his fingerprint. Yeah. Next page. Yeah. The fourth thing is life can hurt, but God still loves. Yeah. And it's not his fault and it's not his design. No. It's right. just that's how it is. It's taken me 36 years to come to the realization that God is not my magic carpet or my Aladdin's lamp. That's right. He's my ever-present help in time of need. I'm going through a lost, fallen world. Satan hates me. Can't wait to get rid of me when I'm already dead. So the thing he could possibly do to me that would bother me has already been taken care of. I died once to myself to sin, and now I'm risen again in him. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Next page. Yes, Almost done. This is it. Okay. Well, let's pray together and I'll send you home. Good work. Good work. Good work. I wrestled the devil for it. I hope it was worth it for you. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I just, it angers me so much because, well, uh, right after I got saved, And then I got married. And about five years later, Jerry, I came home from work one day and she's holding this, I want this Pez dispenser. <laughs> and, there, and there's balloons. And, and I'm like, going, well, well, what's that? And I thought I had missed an anniversary or something. She's trying to tell me she's pregnant. And I, I literally fell backwards over the piano bins and hit the ground. I was so stunned. But from the moment, oh, from the moment I knew she was pregnant, every night I would, I would talk to her belly. We didn't, 
We chose not to know the sex of the child till birth. We just wanted want to be a surprise. <coughs> and every night I pray over that belly and speak to that belly. And, and as she got bigger, as, as the baby got bigger, and I would feel that knee moving across there and that elbow, and I felt the life in there. I didn't know what I was going to be, but I knew one thing. I wanted to be a good dad. Right. I wanted to be everything I could possibly be that maybe I felt like I didn't get right. for them. And it was funny. When Taylor was born, she was crying her head off. And I said, hey, girl. Wow. She knew my voice. She knew her daddy's voice. And this morning, I want you to know that there's a God that loves you greater than I could even possibly love my children. And I can't fathom that because, you know, I love my wife. But I, you know, before we had children, I could probably tell you that I love my wife because she, the way she made me feel because I was so selfish and so all about me. But when those kids came along, I finally realized, now here's something that I would gladly give my life in place of. Because it takes something out of you. And so what I want you to understand is, is that if you've been laboring under some delusion that God's mad at you or disappointed in you or waiting on you to do something for him to love you or he's put bad things in your way to punish you, if he's anything but that loving father calling your name to get your attention and you, you've been fed some wrong information, we live in a world that's full of bad things. He's trying to get to us. He hates the bad things worse than we hate the bad things. And he's not up there like some puppet master watching you suffer and getting some sort of enjoyment out of it. We just haven't figured it out yet. But we're going to get there. All things will work together. It, it'll work out if you'll hang on to him. He's the vine that you swing from one tree to the next. And so I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a second. I'm not going to bring you in the front. I'm not going to embarrass you in any kind of way. But I want to break something. I want to break a generational curse. I want to break a, a, a thought process in you that you're living perpetually under some sort of guilt or condemnation or I'm just never good enough or I'm not going to try because there's no way I can ever get there. And I want you to know that your father loves you so much that he'd give himself a, just to have you. If anybody in this room would just like to wave at me real quick and say, I want to be free. Yes, man. I want, I want this broken off of me today. I don't want another day of walking around feeling like I'm less than, unworthy, not good enough, not a good enough Christian, not a good enough husband, not a good enough wife, not a good enough son, not a good enough daughter, not a good enough mother, not a good enough father. I want to walk out here knowing I've been blessed and he's never taken it away. And I'm going to walk out here and multiply. I'm going to fill the earth. I'm going to subdue and conquer. Because that's what Jesus gave me with his life. Anybody else, real quick, the right hand say, I just want a new start today. I want to have that peace that passes and understanding. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. All over the place. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If anybody wants to come to the altar, I'm not going to ask you why you came. I'm going to play this song for just a minute. Let you have a little moment if you want to, God. Come lay it down at his feet if you wish. And we'll dismiss him now.